you have to make sure that any like running eight to 12 seconds can never be used against you. And it's yeah, like, well, oh that's God, product. that's such an unbelievably high bar to set. There's no way, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, so let me let me dial it back here for yeah. a second because I really, I have got some specific questions about the Friedman thing. So, oh yeah, go for it, sorry. So no, no, no. So when you get a chance, you should listen to that interview with Shapiro because like he's he's surprisingly not performative at all. Like one mm -hmm. of my issues with him is I think he leans, I think he's poisoned the discourse as much as anybody. Like, mm -hmm. for a facts don't care about your feelings kind of guy, like, like the the metas that he created with like dunking on these college kids. And he wrote yeah. a book where it was basically like, the only way you should engage with the left is basically just to dunk on them. You shouldn't engage oh, with Oh, wait, was that the book? Like, how to, like, how to win an art? Or, fuck, there's a name, what was it called? Something like that. Yeah, I, I didn't read it, but I mean, that was the gist of it. Or arguments for conservatives or something like this. Something, it was something like this, but yeah, what about it, yeah? Well, so what was interesting was to see him relatively like unguarded and not performative at all. Like he was actually pretty critical of Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and like, and Friedman asked really good questions that he asked of you too. Like name one thing good about this person, one thing bad about this person. So, mm -hmm. you know, Shapiro was like, I think Biden's a really good dad. I think it's really obvious. And when conservatives were dunking on him for the, the voicemail that he left, like Hunter Biden, did you hear that? Uh, the, the voicemail that Biden left his son. Yeah, dude, this is this happened the first time the laptop shit, the laptop stuff leaked, and people were making fun of Biden, like, oh god, this is so horrible. But when you look at the text, it was like Biden saying some shit where it's like, hey, like I understand you're lost, like I always love you, son, like you're always welcome back. And I'm like, are you guys serious right now? <laughs> like, what the fuck? Like these are actually like, especially in the fuck. Hold on, I it sucks. It's hard to talk about this because I'm a dad, so stupid sure. shit involving kids is actually more difficult to talk about when you're a parent. I don't know why it just becomes it. But when you contextualize the fact that Biden has already lost a son, right, at least one, right, um, to like a to to an, a horrible accident. Um, is it two sons dead? Is it like one in a car? Accident, I thought it was a son and a daughter, but I could be wrong. Okay, it might be son and a daughter. When you figure that he's already lost a child and a wife, and then he's got another child who's like addicted to fucking drugs. And he's still like, oh, you know, like, hey, um, I love you. And, you know, you're always oh, no, no. Like so I'm sorry. So, yeah, it was a wife and daughter that died in the car accident. And then his oldest son, Bo Biden, died a couple of years ago. Was it cancer? That. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And it's like, Jesus. And then his last son. Yeah. But he's still like he's, he comes across like a very, very loving father. He comes across a really good man. He really does. And in, in most of his life and most of how he's conducted himself. I don't like and it's and it's so frustrating because conservatives are like, look how creepy he is with children. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of weird, but it's like some old man shit. But for most yeah, of his it, life, it's, it's, like he's been it's a stellar really, person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really handsy old man, old grandpa vibes. And again, I'm not I'm not saying that it doesn't need to change with the time. So be it. But the idea that there's anything salacious behind yeah. it is is bullshit. But Shapiro, I, I think it was Shapiro's best interview. And again, maybe it was performative because, mm -hmm. again, I don't know. I don't know this Friedman guy. I don't know, like, how you approach that dynamic. Friedman is anyways, a he is a very uh, like almost to a fault, like compassionate, honest guy. Like he very, very, very much wants people to be like, um, like, I want you to tell me how you really feel about things. I want to bridge divides. I want people to. Um, I, like I, I want to bring people together and like reduce the amount of hate and increase the amount of love in the world. Like that's very much like the vibe that he's on. Like serious. Like and he's very seriously committed to it. Yeah. So I mean, he came off that way in the interview with Shapiro and then the interview with you. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, you should definitely check it out. And, and so okay. then I, I watch, watch it now on your recommendation. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. And and remember when you recommend it to everybody else, be like ruminate. Yeah. was the one who brought this to my attention. He's kind of the hero of this. Gotcha. Your interview was excellent as well. And I I, I got frustrated only at one point, and, uh -oh. and it was with Friedman. Oh, and boy. I wanted to ask you about that. So it was when he asked you about President Biden, and specifically the— Oh, uh, the, was it the speech? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And and I, I got to give you kudos there because it was interesting because you, you did push back, and you correctly said, look— you know, he, Biden was very clear with his language. He was very. Did we specific. watch that was, on? Did he show that in the podcast where yes. we watched the clip? Okay, because yes, I made did. him look at. I was like, let's look it up and see what he actually said. Yeah. No, he put that in the interview. Mm -hmm. My frustration was then he doubled down on it, and so I guess before we get in, do you think Friedman was playing the devil's advocate to tease a clarification out of you? Because fair enough, it's a it's a common interview tactic, but or do you think he was sincerely because he is a very compassionate, empathetic person, according to you? He sincerely believed that Biden was being divisive and unclear with his language. 
He probably thought that Biden was being a bit more divisive than he should have been, but I think it's probably because of the type of media that he's heard before, because I don't think he'd seen the full context of that speech beforehand, so he's probably already loaded coming in. It just, it sucks that, like, like I, to some extent, I try to say that, you know, oh, I'm always trying to be careful with my language, et cetera, et cetera, but, like, at the end of the day, god damn, how much... um how much responsibility do you have that not only do you have to be responsible for your speech, you have to make sure that any like running eight to 12 seconds can never be used against you. And it's yeah, like, well, oh God, point. that's such an unbelievably high bar to set. There's no way, you know? Yeah. It's, it's not possible because you can always, I mean, you know this better than anybody in, in people in your space. You can always be, what's the expression? Clip, clip chimped or whatever, like where they can just excise these like mm -hmm. very small segments there's no way that you can load every single sentence with enough disclaimers yeah. that would get around people who want to clip you out of context. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I think, you know, more progressive commentators, you know, people like the Young Turks, Turks and whatnot, they've made the case, and I think it's true. If anything, you could make the case that Biden was being too charitable to the Republican Party because he went out of his way to say... I want to be clear, you know, it's not all the Republican Party. It's not even most of the Republican Party. Yeah, and, and he just said that, like, yesterday or the day before, too, when he was speaking. He's right. like, I don't even think it's the majority of Republicans. Yeah. Right, and polls would actually, you know, there's there's some ambiguity there. <laughs> He's wrong. <laughs> right, Because yeah, I think it's like, yeah. isn't it like 75% of Republicans right now still think the election was stolen? Over 60, believe, well, again, it depends on the poll, right? Sure. It depends on the month, but it's always been over 50%. Yeah, so, like, it is beliefs. it is most Republicans. So, yeah, that is true. Biden is actually being too charitable. He really is, yeah. But he right. still gets called out for not being charitable enough. I was like, bruv. There was well, so, one other thing that he said that was wrong, too. I'm sorry, just real quick. I was no, go ahead, please. Um, but uh, he also mentioned, when I was pushing on that, like, I don't know if this made it to the show or not, but he was trying to say, I was saying, my guess is is that Joe Rogan fans are probably a lot more anti-vax than the normal population. And he was like, no, it's probably actually lines up about with the normal population. I think somebody actually emailed me the data on that. And it was like 50% of Joe Rogan fans are vaccinated compared to like 75 or 80% of the normal population. And I was like, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, but okay, yeah, go ahead. So well, the thing about the, the Biden thing, I guess that kind of frustrates me is mm -hmm. it seems like there are two, the reason I asked if he was being sincere mm -hmm. and, and wasn't playing the devil's advocate is because it, I've, I've heard this a lot of people of Biden where they were like, Biden campaigned as a unifier and he's supposed to be non-controversial. In fact, the Daily Wire crew said this in their post midterm roundup. Uh, I saw somebody react to that, you know, Biden was elected to be quote unquote dead. And they mean just like not particularly judicious or yep. legislatively effective. Yeah, right. And not to offend anybody to be the anti-Trump. And my frustration is twofold. Number one, when every president takes the oath of office, every president, Republican or Democrat, they say they take the same oath of office and they're supposed to be accountable to everybody. It's not just a special standard for Joe Biden. I understand that he rhetorically on the campaign trail made a bigger deal about how he's going to try to be more of a unifier. But the fact of the matter is Donald Trump had that same obligation mm -hmm. and should be held to the same standard when he was president because he took the same oath of office. He wasn't supposed to be the RNC chairman. He was supposed to be the sitting president of the United States yeah. and, you know, uphold the Constitution for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, number one, it seems like there again, Biden and Democrats are held to a radically different standard, even by somebody like Friedman, who I have no idea what his political biases are, but he seems really compassionate, like you said. Mm -hmm. So that's frustrating. It's This guy is clearly not partisan, and he's holding Biden to a different standard. And then the second thing is... I mean, the, to be clear, let me just represent. I'm pretty sure, sure. Um, he would say that Trump was unprecedentedly divisive as well. I would imagine Friedman would say that too, but yeah, go ahead. That's fair. I didn't hear mm -hmm. that out of him, so mm -hmm. so maybe that concession would have gone a long way for me. Sure. But but then the second thing is about leadership. I think you were, were trying to make the case that who, no matter who is president, this idea that they're supposed to be the nation's cheerleader and not critical of like elements that need to be criticized that's ridiculous i would argue that that is inherent to any leadership position mm -hmm. do you do you think did it seem like friedman was reticent like he didn't believe that for presidents or just leadership in positions in general like i mean i think i tried to make that a case that like part of being a leader is being critical of toxic aspects within your organization like you have to be able to do that right no, um, yeah, and I agree. But did did I guess did you get the vibe that he has a different conception of leadership in general, or just presidential leadership, where 
yeah, if you're a CEO, if you're, you know, a teacher, or principal, whatever, yeah, you can be, you know, you can call, you know, I think I don't want to, I don't want to speak from too much, but my guess is that like at the end of the day, he's just looking for people to like all kind of like come together more and be more chill. It's probably gotcha. so he's just looking to maximum reduction of all of that type of speech. Yeah. Well, I think you did a really good job pushing back on that. It was very frustrating to hear because it seems like it seems like when um, Republicans misbehave, it just seems like everybody and, and not just conservatives would be bad enough because they have a vested interest in, you know, a favorable outcome and grading Republicans on a curve. We mm -hmm. expect people to do that. The left does it, too. To some extent, I would argue not as bad, but it also seems like everybody else holds Democrats to a higher standard. So like even Including the Democrats. Media. Well, yeah, no, CNN and MSNBC, when Biden made that speech in front of Independence Hall, he got called out by, you know, Chuck Todd on Meet the Press. And, and there were CNN and New York Times op-eds about it, about how the president was so divisive. To me, that's bullshit. It's not fair. And I actually would argue that that also contributes to the erosion of institutions if we're going to grade Republicans on a curve. Trump can say whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it, one thing from Biden that is that can be interpreted as divisive is equal to 10 divisive statements from Trump from Trump. My God, Trump referred to Democrats as fascists. He called <laughs> Democrats out left, I've, right and center. Oh, man, there's one thing that happened when I went on that big Republican podcast a few days ago for the election shit is uh, I predicted this going and I was like, no one here is going to defend Trump. They're all going to say like, well, I don't defend Trump, blah, 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 blah. And every single Every single one of them did that. I think every single one of them was like, well, I'm not a huge person to defend Trump. Another thing that was really funny, though, Lauren Chen tried this, is I said, because somebody asked me, I think somebody asked me or posed a question like, why do you hate Trump so much or what's so bad about Trump or something like that. Um, but at some point I was giving a speech where I was like, okay, well, Trump is like uniquely bad because of the election denying stuff. And then I think it was Lauren Chen and a few others started to pipe up and they were like, oh, well, the Democrats did that too. Like Hillary Clinton, you know, said something. And I made a bet. I think I was like, I'll bet you $10,000 to any organization you want right now that I could find like a hundred statements every single time Trump has denied the election to any like Democrat, like Hillary Clinton or whatever. And nobody took me up on the bet. It was kind of crazy, but it was really no, funny. I because love that I, part. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I the saw, conversation died that, right yeah, there. Where, where she's her, con, her exact words were, well, I don't think it makes much of a difference in terms of frequency. Like, I don't think that matters all that much. If we can just agree it happened. And like, that's, that's bullshit. You know, mm -hmm. one person, it, it, the idea that we can't recognize meaningful substantive distinctions between two bad acts or two the two bad actors is ridiculous so to me it's like the the example that i always use in conversation with conservatives it's like when it comes to the election denial thing mm -hmm. they'll say they'll appeal to stacey abrams they'll appeal to hillary clinton yeah and they'll say both sides do it both sides both sides both sides and there were a couple of democrats who during the certification of of donald trump's uh, 2016 victory, there were a couple of Democrats who objected. Mm -hmm. And it's like, to me, this is the exact, this is fundamentally the same thing as saying that a jaywalker and an axe murderer are the same thing because they're both criminals. Sure. And it's like, if that's the end of your analysis, that's lazy and dishonest. There oh, are incredibly, a... go ahead. They're incredibly, what were you going to say? No, there are, there, there are incredibly important distinctions to make between these two things. And mm -hmm. it's lazy to suggest because they share like one broad categorization that that's where the analysis ends and we got to move on and both sides are the same. I don't remember if this was Slate Star Codex or if it was um, another blogger that I read an essay on. It was very, very interesting. He, the, there was a guy, he created a name for like a specific fallacy um, just to like have something to call it. But it was, he was writing about the phenomenon of like where you... It's like the goal is to like label somebody something that's technically true, but they only fit it in like kind of an edge case sort of way. And it gets you to fight a battle that's like totally not relevant um but it's a way of kind of like discrediting people oh the non-central fallacy i think is what he called it but um, non, i've never heard of it yeah the the argument that he used or the example that he used was like um you say something like uh i think martin luther king was a great man and then somebody counters and you go well i don't think he was a great man martin luther king was a criminal and the statement is technically true because I don't remember if it was adultery or, or he stole or so, I don't remember. Some, some, I think it was adultery. It might have been adultery. Yeah. He did something yeah. where it was technically illegal or something. And he was technically like a criminal. I think he got convicted on something. Or, or, I don't know. I just remember that the technicality of it was right. But when you bring the, the – when you say criminal, when you bring that to mind, you're bringing to mind a very specific type of thing in order to, to discredit him. And even though it is true that he's a criminal, you're calling him a criminal to bring together, to, to, to call forth this idea of what a criminal is to discredit something else. And when you're in a debate with somebody, it 
it mind fucks you because there's two things that happens. One is you might say, well, no, hold on. He's not a criminal. And so you'll either start debating something that's actually wrong, and then you just lose right, the debate. Right, technically you know, wrong, yeah. right? Yeah. Or you're like trying to say why being a criminal isn't bad, but it, I mean, it kind of is, or it's not relevant. But I mean, if you're calling it a question about his character, but it's like, it's a really mind fucky way to like basically win an argument, but you haven't actually said anything that's relevant at all. I just thought it was a really interesting essay. Really. No, I mean, yeah. I, I'd never heard of the, the label of the fallacy before. Yeah. I mean, you, we've all seen it in action mm -hmm. and that's, that's it. I mean, it, it's just a, basically a way to, to cause someone to earn some sort of dis, disrepute so you know, I, but I like guess in a totally non comparable way, and people do it all the time with like, uh, well, the Democrats actually said that there was election interference too, and they want to compare like the Russia stuff to Trump saying that like vote tallies were actually changed, and like there was a widespread conspiracy, and it's like, like these are not. You the called same that thing. out in the Chen thing mm -hmm. pretty solidly too. Like I, I saw you throw your hands up and be like, no, 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 these are these are fundamentally different mm -hmm. things. I mean, maybe some people in the media overplayed the collusion argument the idea that trump was knowingly working with the russians but that was never the legal basis by which you know robert Mueller was conducting yeah. his investigation and the attorneys and prosecutors involved were infinitely more precise with their language mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is they did prove that you know russia did attempt to interfere on well, trump's behalf yeah not attempt there were actual like companies set up in the united states that no, were well <laughs> yeah what i what I, I what i mean by attempt is i don't know if it was ever determined to what degree it influenced the oh i mean that's impossible results. to know right yeah. right mm -hmm. right but yes cl clearly they it wasn't just theoretical they made you know they took efforts that to to impact the election on trump's behalf we just don't know the magnitude to which it, it worked no yeah. but the, to me it's like um just again the, the 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 disparate standards involved because the two people who objected to trump's uh vote certification the electoral votes they were supposed to get in order for like an uh, an objection to be official mm -hmm. it has to be written and it has to be co-signed by a member of both chambers so if a senator during the certification mm -hmm. uh, wants to launch a formal objection it has to be written down and then somebody from the house has to co-sign or vice versa and nobody did. I think it was two Democratic senators that objected, and they couldn't get anybody, any Democrat on the other side, to co-sign it because they were like, yeah, we're not happy about it, mm -hmm. but we're not going to formally object to this. So it's like you compare two informal objections for Trump compared to the 140 formal objections mm -hmm. to Biden that happened after January 6th. So it was after the Capitol was invaded. So to me, it's just like... I don't know. It, it's it's really frustrating to see the the double standard involved that I feel like everybody enforces, yeah. not just on the right, but also on in the, the mainstream. Well, yeah. yeah. I appreciate that, Destiny. All right. Bye. Remember to hit that like and subscribe, and don't forget the notification bell so that my videos show up right in your feed. Ah.